This week on Arizona Illustrated, monsoon wildlife, a living desert, farming poultry in southern Arizona. No one wants to be cooped up in a dark, cold factory setting, so I have to understand what makes them happy. And Picacho Peak, geology, ecology, and history. It is so strong and resistant to erosion that it's held out much longer than the other rocks that were here at one time. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. It's not been as dramatic as the start of last season, but it's here. On any given afternoon, the wind will pick up, the skies will darken, the clouds will rumble and crack with thunder, and then a welcome and drenching rain will fall on our dry desert region. The monsoon is upon us, and storms can be exciting and dangerous. For desert plants and trees, they are life-giving, and for some of Arizona's most remarkable creatures, summer rain signal a time for courtship and mating. The desert tortoise will become active during our monsoon season, and uh, this is also the season that we often will see some breeding behavior between the two sexes of the tortoises. So the males often approach the females and they initiate contact by bobbing their heads and touching noses. And uh, that's usually a, a tortoise hello, as it were. My name is Renee Lazat. I am a keeper at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in the herpetology department. She'll lay her eggs within a few weeks of mating and usually by the end of June they're laying their eggs and then the baby tortoises will emerge at the end of the monsoon season. So right around the end of August, early September is when we're going to start seeing those baby tortoises come up. They love grasses. Grasses is probably their number one food source. But then the, the annual plants would be the secondary food sources. And fortunately, those are very available by the end of monsoon. Baby tortoises are predated upon by a lot of different things, whether uh, small mammals will sometimes go after them. Um, some of the larger birds like ravens or even thrashers might go after the baby tortoises. So it's a tough life. You gotta really blend in and stay out of trouble. The giant desert hairy scorpion is one that uh, is our largest scorpion of this region. And it's really closely associated as other animals with our rainy season. So it stays deep underground, kind of following the moisture line. As the rains come and start soaking things, it moves closer up to the surface. And by our summertime rains, when those are really in full force, by that time it's on the surface looking for a mate, looking for food, and doing its thing. Uh, my name is Howard Byrne, and I'm uh, the invertebrate keeper here at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. The breeding cycle, that's a really fun story because that scorpion will actually, like many scorpions, the males will actually do a little dance for the females to court her. Um, and then they will actually lay down a special object called a spermatophore, and then they'll grab claws with her, or pedipalps, and they'll try to drag her over top of that to complete mating. If the mating goes well, um, the female will actually give live birth, and in doing that, she will fold her legs underneath of her body, making what's called a birth basket. The little ones drop into the birth basket and then crawl up on mama's back, and she takes care of them for a while. So just her presence is a great way to deter predators from eating the little ones. They don't do much. You know, while they're on the mother's back, they don't eat, they don't do much of anything. In fact, if you were to shine an ultraviolet light on the babies, they would not fluoresce where the adults do until they molt that exoskeleton. Then they'll fluoresce underneath a UV light. Uh, and then at that point, after they've molted, they will leave mama's back, disperse, and go on and hunt on their own. Some of the things we might see out and about are millipedes. My name is Sandy Wright, and I work for Pima County Natural Resources, Parks and Recreation, and I'm an environmental educator. After a good rain event, we're usually early in the morning, we see them. 
Uh, millipedes are arthropods. They have a, a hard exoskeleton, similar to insects and other similar species. Um, and like some other species of insects and arthropods, they lay eggs, but they don't take care of those eggs. They lay the eggs and then move on. And when the little babies hatch, they're pretty much on their own and can survive on their own. Although, although probably most of them don't survive. They're preyed upon by other species. Millipedes are harmless. They're a great little uh, creature to watch during the monsoon, and so there's, there's no reason to fear them. You probably don't want to touch them just like you don't want to touch other types of wildlife. Watch from a distance is a good policy. And they are uh, vegetarians, unlike the centipedes that are carnivores, and sometimes people confuse those two. The giant desert centipede is probably, to me, one of our most exciting animals. It has great warning coloration. Um, it's a very willing and engaging predator, no hesitation. Sometimes tarantulas and other things can be a little hesitant about accepting prey, but the giant desert centipede is willing to engage, and it will eat almost anything it can overpower. Uh, its breeding cycle is tied closely to that rainy season. It's another one of those animals that stays deep underground. They're gonna wait for that moisture to reach closer to the surface. Um, when they are ready, uh, the male and female will mate um, if that all goes well, she will lay eggs, about a dozen or 20 eggs, uh, little yellow eggs in a ball, and she will wrap around them and rest her head like some snakes will do right on top and protect those eggs. She'll groom them and take care of them. Uh, when they hatch, they turn into little nymphs. Um, at that point, she'll stick around just a little longer and then they all disperse and go their own way. The vinegaroon, or the whip scorpion, is probably, maybe by some people's standards, the ugliest and most awful, intimidating looking creature uh, we have. The good news is it's not really around here where saguaros grow, but if you move down into dry grassland areas, uh, right about where the oak line starts, again, during that rainy season, that's when you're going to come up, that's when we're going to see them. Um, that's when you might, if you're lucky, uh, on a nice rainy, cool night, run into the vinegaroon. Instead of using a stinger or any kind of venom, it doesn't have any of those. But what it does is it can squirt vinegar at whatever's bothering it. So about 85% vinegar, just enough to irritate the eyes and the mucous membranes right into the eyes, mouth, or nose of something that's bothering it is usually enough to have a smell and a taste that can change a predator's mind about whether that animal is on the menu. The vinegaroons are going to be mating during that rainy season. The male is going to court with the female and mate with her. Then he's going to leave and have nothing to do with the situation anymore. When mom has eggs, they're going to be attached to her abdomen. Uh, when those hatch, much like the scorpion story, they're going to crawl up under her back. And then at some point over the next few weeks, they're going to disperse and go about their business finding food. The farm landscapes of southern Arizona are some of the oldest in North America, and our local food economy has been thriving for generations. With the farm-to-table movement in full bloom, Tucsonans are enjoying many options for locally grown foods at restaurants and farmers markets. In 2016, we caught up with two young farmers who are bringing the fruits of their labor directly to southern Arizonans. It's a cool Sunday morning at the Rito Park Farmer's Market in Tucson. Southern Arizonans are here to buy local produce and fresh meat. Pepper, you know, like, like nice coarse ground, and press it into the flush side. Okay. Two local farmers here today are Michael and Luke Mutehart. Beautiful. We sell fresh pastured poultry uh, to restaurants in Tucson and uh, to customers at farmer's markets. Hello. Do you guys have any chickens? It's clear to us that uh, the people that shop here really are looking for quality ingredients raised by farmers. It was running around our, our pasture yesterday morning and it's now um, going to be in your frying pan. Luke Mutehart is Michael's younger brother. Together they own Top Knot Farms, a poultry operation just outside of Benson, Arizona. They are part of the growing farm-to-table movement. 
Meat doesn't come from Walmart and it doesn't come from plastic wrapped containers in a, in a dairy case. It comes from an animal. So in order to understand the farm to table or to be a part of that, you really need to understand or know your farmer. These are probably only two or three days old. So These farmers raise and harvest chickens, ducks, and seasonally other fowl like turkey and guinea hen. I was very interested in doing this project because of my cooking and chef background. It was um, amazing to me to think about what we could offer. Chicken. Sure. Do you sell oh. them whole? We do. We have three pound birds and we have some that are smaller. Do you like smaller? Michael or graduated from McCord on Blue cooking dog. school and went on to work in George Perrier's world famous um, Lebec no, Fen in Philadelphia. Yeah. In my time in the French kitchens, I was exposed to things like quail, pheasant, grouse, partridge. We have a, a whole duck for sale today. He's been a chef for 15 years, most recently running the kitchen at Dish Bistro in Tucson. I love crispy skin on a chicken. I love crispy skin on a duck. But when I cook for myself, I'm always doing a high heat cooking method and the meat stays juicy. Anything where you want a really thick, rich yolk, they're delicious. The brothers are quick to share their cooking methods and recipes with customers. Um, our favorite way is to cook them in a pan and get them a little bit crispy. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. While from Tucson, they did much of their growing up in Yuma. Luke, the youngest, and Michael, the oldest of four boys. Michael yeah. credits his parents for instilling good values in him and his brothers. Characteristics that they've always asked us to be, you know, honest, forgiving, compassionate, um, hardworking, obviously. My brothers and I are very lucky to, to have had that good family support system behind us, I mean, since we were little. This, it kind of forces people to watch where they're walking. and it kind Their of father, Paul, by. is the general manager of a large produce farm. In, in Yuma, they're all family farms. They're large farms, but they're family farms. And, and what I wanted the boys to understand was they can work for themselves, that they can be entrepreneurs, that they don't need to work for a paycheck for somebody. They've taken it to heart, and they're very independent. It's the American dream. You know, give it a try. That independent spirit is also in their mother, Jane. Her dream was that her boys be self-sufficient. Taught them to do laundry and sew on buttons and cook for themselves. Food is real important to me and my family. I'm Italian, and I wanted my boys to learn how to cook, and they all cook. There's even rumor of a top-knot recipe book, but for now, their hands are full, raising birds. This is a, a chick that arrived um, probably Wednesday or Thursday on the farm, so he's about three or four days old. Um, so he's brand new and he'll live in this brooder house for about four weeks before we put him out to pasture. And then he'll spend another four weeks, plus or minus, depending on what size the customer orders. And then he will become dinner. Luke works as a site superintendent for a general contractor and is a graduate of the architecture program at the University of Arizona. He designed the brooder house and the barns at Top Knot. No one wants to be cooped up in a dark, cold factory setting or an office setting. It's the same formula whether I'm designing a building for people or for an animal. So I have to understand what the chickens need, how they grow, what makes them happy, and that's natural sunlight, plenty of ventilation, clean drinking water, and shelter. They wake up when the sun comes up and they go to sleep when the sun goes down and they eat when they're hungry. We don't force feed them or we don't have lights on timers that, that wake the birds up to eat. They're able to, to experience natural life. While they don't use any medicated feed or hormones, their birds are supplemented with a corn ration. The natural life they strive to create for them includes being pasture raised. <laughs> We want them to be able to go out and eat blades of grass and leaves and bugs and seeds. We know that that is how birds should be living. That's how they're designed to live, to, to be able to, to eat green, fresh things. And uh, 
we're working on uh, providing that for all of the birds that we produce on our farm. Providing the best environment that we can for our birds is good for the birds and it's good for the, the end consumer, the people that eat the birds. Top Knot Farms is on desert land, rural and remote, sitting due south of the Rincon Mountains. Where we are, we don't get very many stations, but Classical comes in clear and um, it works for everybody. We like it, the birds seem to like it. And I think the birds get a kick out of that too. I don't know if it makes a difference on how they taste, I doubt it, but it's, it's a good environment. That good environment is enhanced by Colton Riley. He's the lead farmhand, and he's been working with Luke and Michael since day one. Really, he's a member of our family. He's a lover of animals and, and nature, and that's what makes him the perfect fit for this job. He's the shepherd of our farm. After a good life on the farm, the birds are brought from pasture to harvest and processed by hand one by one. Pot should be ready for you. The whole process takes about five to six minutes before they are chilled on ice, packaged, and refrigerated. My brother really likes to get into the details right, so and he's very meticulous, which is good because we're trying to sell a premium product at a premium mm -hmm. price. And if our product isn't perfect, we don't send it out. Part of our philosophy is that everything gets used and what little waste there is, we compost and we put it back into our farm. They slaughter weekly and bring their poultry to market fresh, not frozen. Along with farmers markets, their chickens and ducks are raised to order for chefs at local restaurants like Proper, Primo, The Coronet, and Augustine Kitchen. I had one chef cook the product and say, wow, this tastes like chicken. Well, yeah, it's chicken. He's like, well, that's not what I mean. I mean, it actually has a flavor to it. It doesn't taste like the seasoning rub I used or the barbecue sauce that's smothered in. It tastes like poultry. And on occasion, that taste is shared on the farm with friends and family. Michael says he's grateful for these times and still loves to cook. I feel very lucky to be able to work and do this business with my brother. We've become pretty close, um, even though we're seven years difference in age. I can't think of somebody else that you would want to trust more or another person you would want to have your back and be there to help you. You know, we went to Benson to create kind of like this ideal life and situation for our chickens. And as a consequence, I myself am living the same life. Um, you know, I'm out there in the beautiful landscape, eating fresh stuff, drinking good water. I feel extremely free to be out there. And uh, it's that feeling that I think is the best part. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share stories from this episode and previous episodes. And like us on Facebook, where you can watch stories, comment, and share your own story ideas. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we share photos and links about our work and what's happening in our community. The two-hour drive from Tucson to Phoenix doesn't offer much in the way of scenery. However, there is one 1,500-foot landmark that's hard to miss. In the spring of 2016, we took exit 219 off of I-10 to explore this beautiful and historically rich natural phenomenon. I think it's beautiful. I've always been intrigued by the cactus and the nature, and uh, we just love to be outside. Look at the other one, it's even lower. 
I like the nature. It's really nice and the hikes are really difficult. In the spring, um, usually there's breezes like this and it's very nice and refreshing. Hello sir, how are you today? My name is Robert Young. I am the park manager of Picacho Peak State Park. With the being the main corridor with the interstate here is uh, on the way to Phoenix or Tucson. We're a little kind of island, if you look at it, uh, through the pass here of just perfect example of Sonoran Desert. The park offers, of course, the unique shape of the, the mountain and the geological aspect of that, but you have the, the, the great Sonoran Desert environment here, and in the springtime, you can have the Mexican gold poppies, and Picacho Peak State Park is one of the best places to, to view the Mexican gold poppies. And in a great year, it just blankets the mountain. It's just a, a total blanket of yellow. Well, for me, we were driving by to Tucson and I couldn't take my eyes off it and I kept taking pictures out the window. And I told my husband, we've got to go back there and go hiking. And today was the day I just said, we're going. So anybody who's hiking up this trail to Picacho Peak, you know, you don't want to be spending all your time thinking about how tired you are. You want to look down and look at gas bubbles, fossil gas bubbles in the volcanic material. And then the gas came out of these bubbles, leaving holes. That is, we call them vesicles. Geologists would never just simply call them holes. You need a fancier term, vesicles. My name is George Davis. I'm a Regents Professor Emeritus, University of Arizona. Department of Geosciences, arrived there in 1970, right out of grad school. There was a time where the geological word on Picacho Peak was that it was the throat of a volcano, preserved, like a big spine, like a conduit to the surface. Enter geological mapping, it turns out that can't be supported. Instead, Picacho Peak is made of flows that are now tilted on, its, on their side. And the volcano that erupted these flows was located 10 kilometers away. Very important part of the story of Picacho Peak is that the rocks we're standing on on Picacho Peak are way out of place. They were originally formed as lava flows on the other side of Picacho Mountain. How can we be certain that there's a link between the two? Well, we have a dotted line that connects the two mountains. One of the dots is that island of dark rock where I'm pointing right now. And the other is the little, almost looks like a fortress on that ridge top in the far distance. Those are volcanic rocks that were folded part of the way to Picacho, but not all of the way. So it's almost like the breadcrumbs we were talking about that left a bit of a trail that causes us to conclude these rocks started out way over there. So we have Picacho Mountain, we have Picacho Peak. Almost no one looks at Picacho Mountain because Picacho Peak is so interesting as a landform. We're talking many years ago here, but approximately 1,500 years ago, this area, this environment was completely different where it was a farming community for the Hohokam Indian. There was actually some running water and, and so forth. So the history of this area does date back to uh, early Native American with the Hohokam. Throughout history, you know, the, the peak itself, Picacho Peak was a, a landmark throughout time. Behind me, you'll see the monument for the Mormon Battalion. The monument was erected in their honor for several things. The Mormon Battalion was contracted by the U.S. government in the 1840s to construct a road through the pass, Picacho Pass, becoming the main corridor as it is today. Not only did they construct that road, but they, they camped here as well um, in their journeys uh, to California. Ready, fire! One of the special events at Picacho Peak State Park is our annual event called Civil War in the Southwest. That is a reenactment of the engagement of the uh, Civil War battle that took place here. We also add two New Mexico territory battles as well. 
and we see on average 200 plus reenactors that come out to participate for that weekend. We see generally 32 to 4,500 spectators come out for that event. My name's Les Hook. Uh, I'm a volunteer, maintenance volunteer here at Cacho Peak State Park. We love to camp. My wife and I raised our kids in the campground. This is a way to give back for all that. We like to talk. We love people and just to get out in God's creation and, and see the beauty in the United States. I hate to be disparaging, but the drive from Phoenix to Tucson or Tucson to Phoenix is not very exciting geologically. There's a lot of alluvium there. And what makes Picacho Peak so fascinating as a landmark, it's something to look at along the way. And it is so strong and resistant to erosion that it's held out much longer than the other rocks that were here at one time. I started at Picacho uh, back in the 80s, and it's been going on since then. Uh, I like to come up at least a couple times a year, oftentimes more than that in the springtime. And I like the challenge, and uh, I love coming out when the wildflowers are in bloom. <clears throat> Beautiful. I've been here approximately 10 times. It's fabulous, it's challenging, um, makes me feel alive. It's good to know at my age I can do it. And, uh, and I get to tell everybody about it and show them the pictures. How old are you? I'm 73. My name is Xavier Holmes and I am five years old. Keep walking around. Easy and hard because the rocks are slippery. And you have to climb up them. I didn't like when we first got here, all those stairs. Majestic. Challenging. Fabulous. Beautiful. Uh, rewarding. Inspiring. And just blessed to be able to do this. And fun. Before you hike anywhere in Arizona, be sure to bring enough water and proper footwear as our climate is dry and hot and our trails can be steep and challenging. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next time.